G'day, I'm Hannah Maloney from Good Life Permaculture, coming to you from Nipaluna Latuita in Hobart, Tasmania. Today I'm going to take you for a little tour around our property so you can get orientated to what we're doing, where we are, all the things that are happening, and to give you a bit of a taster for the things to come. Let's get started. We've been here since early 2013 and we got the property uh, because it was pretty marginal. It was incredibly steep, set back from the roads. You could only walk up here from a 100 metre staircase to our neighbour's garden and there was covered in weeds or grass. <laughs> so we did a lot of excavations and we did a lot of slope stabilisations as well. And in 2017 we bought the neighbouring weed block which allowed us to really expand along contour and set up our beautiful veggies and orchards and goat systems that we've got now. So it's required a huge amount of work and, and only recently has it turned the corner and becoming a really productive, uh, almost relaxing place to live. <laughs> So slope stabilisation has been a huge part of our lives the past years that we've been living here. And because our budget was non-existent when we started, we had to work out how to retain all this earth without spunky rock or stone retaining wall. And so we um, put the uh, banks in between the flat terraces back on a, a pretty sharp angle around 30 degrees. And we've used timber pallets, heat treated, so no chemicals. Um, we've wedged them back into the bank and use them to stabilise all that soil, help catch and store nutrients instead of it shooting off down the slope, while we established all these little plants that are now uh, replacing the pellets. Their roots are now holding the slope in place. And these pellets, as you can see, are starting to rot in place, which was the plan. So these banks are what we called food forests. So they're made up of strategically chosen plants which can all work and live together in harmony. So nothing's competing with the other and they're all doing multiple jobs. So they're, if they're not creating food for us, they're feeding the soil or attracting pollinators. So it's a win, win, win. And at the end of the day, we've created a system which is beautiful, incredibly functional, and it didn't break our bank balance because we didn't even have one at that time. <laughs> Uh, but having the annuals on the flat space means that it can catch and store water that's coming down from the rainflow, sinking it into the soil here to benefit these plants. Most of our property is actually perennial though, so the perennial food forests, natives and some ornamentals because they're more stable in the soil, they hold water in the ground for longer and once established the food forests produce huge amounts of food for a lot less inputs compared to the annuals. So this is darling Gertie and Dilly here. And these are our much, much loved milking goats. So I milk them both every morning and we make lots of cheese and yogurt and out of the milk and give it away as well. And they're incredibly important part of our gardening system um, because we harvest all their poo in their deep litter with the wood chips. And they end up going back onto our orchards and once fully composted and go into the annuals as well. And look, they're gorgeous. Like what's not to love here? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so next to our goat and chicken system, we've got a few things going on. We've got a worm farm bleaching its worm wean beneath the mulberry tree, which it loves. We've got a gorgeous chook house over here and a really nice huge worm farm, because which processes us uh, food waste and provides lots of fertility. We've got our sun baking Frida Maria here as well. <laughs> On the other side, we've got our chook feeder, which is separate to their main run. So the, oh, and she's six years old. Just, she wants you to know she's six years old. <laughs> we keep the chook feeder separate to the goat run. Otherwise the goats will headbutt that and just destroy it. <laughs> um, and over here, we've got some multifunctional bays, which right now we're using to store all this deep litter, which was scraped out of the goat and chook run. And it's already half composted. And you'll sit here for a few more months, finishing that composting process. And it is so good. This is what we call a slow, cold composting system where it's in the run for quite a few months, like probably six months before it's scraped out. It's got lots of animal manure, rain, wood chips in there, and it produces beautiful compost, which can eventually go back onto the orchards or the food gardens. And this is what we call a nutrient cycling hub, which any garden, no matter how big or small, will benefit from having. 
we're in a, a more established area of our garden now. We've got mostly mature fruit trees all lined up along contour to make the most of the slope. So he's catching, storing water and nutrient into the soil. And because we're in winter, we're actually kind of pruning some of them, which is what this ladder is doing. But it's now quite dormant, but over summer time, it becomes this gorgeous archway of greenery and edibility, which is gorgeous. Um, yeah, and we've got lots of understory, which will come up more so in summertime. This area is more of a floral understory, so you can see some nasturtium leaves here, but over on this side, fever few is here, but come, come summertime, nasturtiums will, and sweet alyssum will pop up here as well. We're always looking at how we can attract uh, beneficial pollinators and insects to the system. And we're also always looking at how can we never have bare soil in the majority of our property. So here is um, a very, very fresh food for us. It's all very baby and young. We've got olives and fajoa as the main um, fruiting crops with globe artichokes and native pig face ground cover with some other floral herbaceous understory. And then we also have some raspberries and other flowers going on. Behind me I have a more mature food forest so these brown sticks here are about to burst into leaf and they're mixed currants so red and black berries and behind me I have some beautiful fajoa trees and the understory is mostly a creeping uh, comfrey which spreads out. This is working really well considering that they will be bunged in on a very tough slope they're doing impressively well. <laughs> These are so important. We have them for, um, for honey, but mostly we have them for pollination. They're incredibly important for having edible crops for ourselves. Our neighbours who've been living in front of us for over 30 years, um, when we got our bees quite uh, some years ago, they said their pollination, their fruit trees tripled, which is such great feedback to have. Um, so it benefits our garden, but they'll fly up to five kilometres in our neighbourhood. So they're benefiting lots and lots of people's gardens. Uh, this terrace here is very much our social terrace, so in, on the same contour as our house. So we come out here very often and have a campfire, which is set to have one actually. Soon, And behind that, we've got a couple of different things happening. <laughs> uh, we've just been pruning back our salvia lecanther hedge, which is what all this um, pruning's from. And you can see its fresh growth is coming on really strong now. So this grows up really big has a vibrant purple flower, also called Mexican sagebush. And this gorgeous native hot bush head is just doing so well. A great hot tip for areas in the southern Australia. This is a great hedging plant, grows really quickly. And then behind us here is um, our much loved cold frame. So we've been resting this over winter, but um, we're about to start planting spring greens in there. And we'll put, on the other end, we'll put some uh, like bush tomatoes in as well for early cropping. So that's been a really great addition to our cool temperate gardening down here yeah now we have a pretty large garden here and while we definitely grow natives and some ornamentals we really prioritize growing food we do this because we're super interested in creating resilient homes and communities and landscapes and this means that in times of disruption whether that's COVID or the climate emergency We've got a beautiful safety net in our home for our own selves, but also for our broader community as well. And that's why we're really keen to share more of our skills online as well as locally, to help people create a good life anywhere, anytime. So in the coming weeks and months, I'm going to be sharing lots of practical videos to help create a good life for all. Yeah.